from Jersey Somar. So I just had a nutritionist appointment and apparently 1200 calories a day is not enough to live on. Some of my memory problems, heat intolerances might be starvation. I weigh 201 pounds. I've been referred for eating disorder. My MD had just told me to lose weight an hour before. Someone replies, please tell me this is a nutritionist specializing in intuitive eating or health at every size. Eh, a gerbil couldn't live on 1200 calories, let alone a full grown human. And some nutritionists will recommend starvation diets too. But yeah, fudge that doctor, cause no. But I prefer Lottie replied, that's gonna be one fat gerbil. A witch betwixt brings us. Remember that according to evidence-based research, your body doesn't determine your health. Just forgot. Oh, really? And the brain doesn't determine mental health either? Wobbly. Nah, it's all in your head. From Mickey Blue Eyes. My blood work indicates I have fatty liver. Surprise, surprise, a couple of doctors have suggested I lose weight. When I asked for other options, they couldn't give me any. Has anyone in this group had success in reducing fatty liver with a weight-neutral approach? Hi, Poi replied. Losing weight gets rid of excess fat? Why is this seen as such a terrible suggestion when it is proven to work? From Love Dove Bunny. I'm watching a virtual training about sleep for my job, and the current topic is obstetry hypoventilation syndrome. Lots of mention of BMI and weight stigma. Not fun. Does anyone know any weight neutral information about this topic or where to find this information? Thanks. Worthy Nick replied. Imagine these people becoming some kind of doctors or any kind of person with influence, giving wrong advice to people seeking help in the future. Fat Doctor UK, anyone? This one comes to us from Nostalgia is Unfair. Body image, what is in your control? Your beliefs. What is out of your control? It's a pie chart with 10 slices. Only five are labeled. Height, shoe size, weight, skin color, shape. Smobosaurus replies, someone needs a course in remedial pie charts. Charts, I said charts. Lose a throwaway brings us. How to deal with fat phobic doctors. Know your rights. Do not tell your doctor your weight. Your medical issues are valid and not from your fatness. Go to the right doctor, preferably a fat one. It continues. Do not be ashamed of your body. There's no need to hide any of your big body's natural features, so do not shave. Do not wear deodorant. Do not wear underwear. Meg replies. I know that's why I wear underwear. Because of shame. Turtle Abyss adds. I always wear two pairs out of excessive shame. From Gata Buena. It's a picture of a woman holding a sign that says, Diabetes is not a punishment for being fat. I think the original version of this picture might have been in a video from about a year ago. This is a follow-up. This photo is from two years ago. I didn't have diabetes then. I do now. Sometimes I need to hear what I wrote back then. Lose weight or else. Who here has been threatened with a type 2 diabetes diagnosis to motivate you to lose weight? Hands. First of all, shame and threats do not increase health. They actually do the opposite. Second of all, thin people can have type 2 diabetes, not just fat people. Third, there's still so much about diabetes, insulin resistance, stress, and bodies that we do not know. If you have type 2 diabetes, know that it isn't a punishment for being fat. You can pursue health in a peace-driven framework through health at every size, trademark. If you don't have type 2 diabetes, don't let the fear of a diagnosis rule your life. You too can seek health through a peace-driven framework that doesn't hinge on guilt, shame, or fear. Let go of that fear and lean into peace. I'm here with you, heart. OCR Amazon replies, Threatened with a type 2 diabetes diagnosis? Does she think the doctor can somehow give her diabetes to punish her? It's called a warning, genius. Flex Drillerson adds, Doctor, if you don't quit smoking, you might develop emphysema and possibly cancer. Patient, why are you threatening me with emphysema and cancer? Apple and Watermelon adds, If you keep walking off that cliff, you'll fall off and probably die. Is that a threat? Obesity is a construct. 
just a friendly reminder that obesity is a construct, as is the obesity epidemic. Sparkly Pink Tutu replies, Yeah, so is time, but that doesn't change the fact that if I don't show up at 8 o'clock, I'm late. Lilac Crusader, Time is an illusion, lunchtime doubly so. From Black Spider Legs, This comes to us from a doctor? Diet culture is the reason people excitedly ask what you did to get so skinny, when the reason could be due to illness, divorce, grief, an eating disorder, and mental health. People are literally struggling with real-life issues, and all diet culture wants to know is what they are doing to get thin. I get it. I used to do it, too. I would compliment my friends and family on how much weight they lost. I would ask, how did you do it? What exactly did you do? How hard was it to lose the weight? I told myself that it worked for them. It must work for me. This thinking is diet culture. Diet culture claims to care about you and your health. But really, that is just another way of saying as long as you are skinny, then you look healthy. Here's the real truth. You cannot tell how healthy someone is by looking at them. You never know why someone lost weight, or for that matter gained weight. And to be honest, that's none of your business. You heard it here first. Never compliment anyone, because you might make a mistake. I don't know the context of this conversation, but I found it on Twitter. Mean Fat Girl writes, She said it right here, but thanks for playing. It's from a Time article. Ariana Grande adds that she is an advocate for healthy eating and that the obesity epidemic in the U.S. bothers her. The fact that the United States has the highest childhood obesity rate in the world frustrates me. Jen replies, Kids should not be obese at 8 years old, etc. And anybody using body positivity when kids' health is going downhill is fake woke. You need to realize, anybody who would rather scream body positivity and not see when stuff isn't about that is fake woke because no other country is that high of obesity as America. So it is a problem, when it's a problem only in the U.S., and it's not fat-shaming wanting kids not to be obese and to grow up without health issues. An adult can be bigger, but a kid being obese will set up that kid for failure. And if you don't see it as an issue that kids have failing organs, etc., because body positivity, you're fake woke. You can tell someone they're still worthy and beautiful and help them in the name of their best health interest without it being bad. Agnieszka replies, Also, a better way to raise awareness for childhood obesity is to actually do something besides licking a donut. How the fudge did that help children of low income who don't have resources to get quality, healthy food? There was no rise in donations or volunteers to help. I'm guessing the backstory is Ariana Grande licked a donut so that nobody would eat it. It seems like a non-story. Agnieszka continues, so you're just fat phobic. Go home. Thank you. Next. Jen replies to that. Bro, you can't just throw the word at me and that makes me fat phobic. <laughs> I literally never said anything to make me fat phobic because I'm not. Yes, she maybe could do more, but what she said was still not a lie. Imagine being chill with kids having an adult's weight on their little bodies. She gets a little unscientific here, but I'll continue. Their bodies will break their bones, etc., and will take so much damage alone, let alone the health factors within, caring and worrying about kids being fed food with toxic stuff and overly much fat in it, than a child should consume is not fatphobic. This comes from Temporary Astronomer. Hashtag body positivity is a movement created by and for people whose bodies exist outside of what's culturally accepted. Hashtag trans people, people of color, disabled people, fat people, etc. Hashtag it's politically motivated. Hashtag too many thin people confuse it for their own personal insecurities surrounding their appearance. Hashtag the two things are not the same and it's knowing that thin people are now trying to co-opt a movement that wasn't meant for them. Kismet Mutiny replies, I've heard so many origin stories about body positivity, I honestly don't know what's true. I've seen some FAs online claim that body positivity isn't for disabled people either that it's only for fat women of color. Ironically, the people who say this seem to be mostly white women in the body positivity space. It's genuinely confusing. If it was intended to be exclusive, then, in my opinion, calling it body positivity was either a failure of branding or a deliberate bait-and-switch. 
it's not reasonable to build up a movement and gain mainstream popularity on the premise of inclusivity, and then turn around and complain about the wrong people using your hashtags. I've also heard multiple versions of how body positivity started, but seen no proof of anything. This one comes to us from Lisa Daisy. I think it's a Reagan Chastain post, so protect your sensitive bits. I I don't know anyone who's lost a significant amount of weight intentionally and permanently and who has a peaceful relationship with food, do you? I'm resharing an old post today as I think this is an important question to reflect on. Research shows that for 95% or more of people, diets don't work. In addition, when we pursue intentional weight loss, also known as dieting, only a very small percentage of people don't gain the weight back. The majority of people gain it all back, and up to two-thirds of people will regain more weight than they lost. One of the biggest determiners of our weight is genetics, in conjunction with a range of other environmental, social, and emotional factors. In addition, the small amount of people who do maintain their weight loss is likely to be engaged in restrictive, obsessive, or disordered food behaviors. Casablanca Lily replies, Having a peaceful relationship with food that leads you to obesity is like having a restful nap while the house fills with smoke. This one comes to us from Elmer 2000. I'm pretty sure this one's also Reagan Chastain. Diet, battlers. If you take credit for the short-term weight loss that is the first part of your client's biological response and then let your client blame themselves or worse, blame them for the weight regain, that is the second part of the same biological response. You're committing a dangerous fraud. The research is clear. The vast majority of people who attempt weight loss will lose weight short-term and then gain it back long-term. These two phases are part of the same biological reaction that bodies have to intentional weight loss attempts, which are at their base about feeding the body less fuel than it needs in the hopes that it will eat itself and become smaller. Those who sell weight loss depend on a narrative where they get credit for the first part of the biological response, but blame their clients for the second part of the response. This contributes to stereotypes about fat people as lazy and lacking willpower, as well as encouraging weight cycling which has been independently correlated with negative health outcomes. This is nothing less than a fraud by the weight loss industry, and we should be calling them out on it. Right Count replies, Also, do you know how fraudulent insulin is? Did you know that if you stop taking it, your blood sugar levels go right back up? And don't even get me started on dental hygiene. Book Hermit adds, I do laundry every week, but my clothes just end up dirty again. Washing sheets is a fraud and doesn't work long-term. Bob the Orange Cat, wait, you're supposed to wash your sheets too? Dimensioned, next, someone will try to tell me that I need to wash my towels. Bob the Orange Cat, why would you wash those? They get wet when you dry yourself off? Brought to us by Just Forgot. This might also be Reagan Chastain, I'm not sure. Diet culture takes your feelings and says, if you can't control your food, exercise, and therefore your body size, I'll take that pain away for you. The thing is, diets can't heal trauma. Diets can't stop difficult times. Diets can't take your pain away. Anomera Cat replies, This is technically correct, which is the best kind of correct. A lot of people lose weight and then realize they still have many, if not all, of the same relationship, family, career, mental health issues they did before. But I suspect this was posted on a fat acceptance account and will just be used to explain why no one should go on a diet lifestyle change. When I think better advice would be to advocate for people to undergo mental health treatment either before and or alongside dieting. And then we need to push for better mental health treatment access. Simply saying, OMG, go get therapy, won't help if people can't book appointments due to lengthy waits. From Blink Day. Possibly Reagan Chastain. You don't have sugar addiction. You have been restricting sugar for so long that any time you allow yourself to have it, you've created an urgency to eat it because tomorrow you won't be allowed to have it again. How did that turn out for you? Did it last, or did you find yourself eating a whole lot of sugar in one sitting? Shrug. Our body and brain do not like restriction. If you tell yourself that you can't have something, or you shouldn't have something, chances are you're going to end up having a lot of that something. Smells like Herb replies. I can relate to this post. I'm not addicted to something I can't say on YouTube. I just have to have it every day, sometimes twice a day. So, yeah. Brought to us by Twin Sons. BMI is outdated and doesn't account for muscle mass. I'm overweight and I also have a lot of muscle. My BMI is 53. 
but my body scans indicated that I have 20% body fat, which puts me in a good category of body fat still. No doctor wants to hear that, though. <laughs> the OP explains. So I did the math, and assuming this guy is the average height for an American man, 5'9", he has a fat mass of 72 pounds and a lean body mass of 298 pounds. Coincidentally, 300 pounds of muscle is the same amount that Ronnie Coleman achieved when he was competing. Ronnie Coleman was just about the biggest bodybuilder that ever was. Brought to us by Olivia Olive. I'm 5'8", 204 pounds. My upper arms are 14 inches in circumference, making them quite fat. And my body fat percentage is 29%. The BMI places me as obese. And U.S. society has declared war on my body. My friend, who is my height, but 140 pounds, got screened for diabetes with me and found from the blood screening that her risk was higher than mine. I can run 5 miles an hour, climb a 180-foot rock wall with ease, and beat you at Mario. But the whole healthier-than-thou thing, yeah, it's a load of poop. Kangaroo has some thoughts on this. I wonder what exactly do they mean by her risk is higher than mine. He finds a reference that says, you are at risk of developing type 2 diabetes, often known as prediabetes, if your HbA1c is between 42 and 48 millimoles per mole. So the friend has a 46 HbA1c and the OP has a 43, for example? It's not a high or lower risk. They are both prediabetic and need to change their diets. And the only one who boasts about being healthier is the OP. From Fording Bascoban. Hi, is there such a thing as an HIES-centered approach to IBS? My experience with my son is that the medical profession does not have a lot to offer, and functional medicine has certain suggestions like taking certain supplements, checking for SIBO, going on FODMAP, but I understand that it can be problematic because it might lead to disordered eating. Is there anything to be done medically or non-medically that is aligned with IE and HIES principles? Latinbot.2 replies, I got my IBS under control via a strict diet. Sorry, fat activist. The best advice I could give you is don't eat things that'll, you know, irritate your bowels. John Prime added, You become ill when you eat this. Don't eat it. That seems intuitive enough. How do they not see that as intuitive eating? LMAO, they forgot what it means and just use it as an excuse to eat everything. From Patagonian Pour over. Someone writes, Thank you for this. My 12-year-old had chocolate with breakfast, a few biscuits, a roll of yogurt, and an ice cream after lunch, and a donut after dinner. He's always allowed something after lunch and dinner, but I got very stressed after lunch and told him it was too much. Er, I found it very hard to hold back. Sad. Someone replies, it's so hard at times. Try to notice what thoughts come up for you and then practice reframing and choosing new thoughts. It's definitely a challenge and it sounds like you have awareness, which is amazing. Lionel Hutz's apprentice replies, What happened to teaching children about sometimes foods? From Kaleidoscopic Yes. Being told by your doctor to lose weight is medical discrimination. Ross Ant replies, Yes. Doctors are completely biased in favor of health. Should have stayed in bed brings us. It's an infographic of sorts. Biological effects of calorie restriction. Diet or caloric restriction begins. That leads to initial weight loss may occur. That leads to brain senses threat to survival. That leads to in an attempt to preserve energy. The brain sends signals throughout the body to increase hunger hormones, Slow the metabolism, decrease body temperature, drop the heart rate, and slow digestion. Four of these are all the exact same thing, that is, slow the metabolism. Which has been shown scientifically, as far as I know, to be only roughly 50 calories a day. Not a huge deal. And you can avoid the increased hunger hormones by choosing your diet carefully. So that infographic is more of a scarrow graphic. From Elmier 2000. It's another infographic. What do you think dieting will look like? I'm going to be so healthy and lose all the weight. Stays on track until loses desired weight. Maintains weight loss forever and lives happily ever after. What dieting actually looks like. 
Starts diet, excited to eat salad. Cravings plus resistance. Craves ice cream but keeps it off limits. Caves in, binges, intense ice cream cravings. Feels guilty and out of control. Resolves to diet yet again, not realizing that diet is the cause of these behaviors. Inside Sympathy replies, I think it should be retitled as What Dieting Should Look Like Versus What Most People Do on a Fad Diet. From Slavic, Went to the doctor this morning for a broken toe. Guess what she wanted to discuss first. I'll give you zero guesses. Wait, how am I supposed to guess without any guesses? Someone replies, It's almost like obesity causes health problems. Wow. It literally doesn't. Sideways eyes. 90% of health problems attributed to obesity can actually be explained by weight cycling, dieting, disordered eating. Just plain being fat isn't inherently bad for you. Carbohydrate King points out, Okay, so even if that 90% statistic were true, that means that 10% of health problems attributed to obesity can actually be explained by obesity. So it does cause health problems, by their own admission. This one comes to us from Olivia Olive. Reminder, fat people dying younger than thin people is a myth. On average, people described as overweight and obese on BMI live just as long or longer than their normal counterparts. Fat phobia sucks. LFK Hale replies, Just reposting one of my posts from the other day. You lose about six and a half years average lifespan for a BMI of 40 to 45. About 14 years of average lifespan for a BMI of 55 to 60. This comes from a study. The following is brought to us by Catastropha. Unfit skinny people are two times as likely to get diabetes as fit fat people. Diabetes is not a personal failing or consequence of fatness. Is there a citation available for this? Yes, I can't link here, but look up the article Everything You Know About Obesity is Wrong, Heart. What the article says. A 2016 study that followed participants for an average of 19 years found that unfit skinny people were twice as likely to get diabetes as fit fat people. The actual study says, Importantly, lean subjects who were unhealthy displayed a greater than two-fold increase in cumulative diabetes when compared with healthy individuals with obesity. However, among unhealthy subjects, diabetes risk rose progressively as BMI status increased from lean to overweight to obesity. That's all pretty complicated, but long story short, for unhealthy people, when your BMI increases, then your risk of diabetes increases. But obese people who don't yet have health problems don't have as much of an increase in diabetes with BMI as thin people who already have health problems. Honestly, these results are so complex that they go well beyond what I can talk about here without you guys falling asleep. And there's other research showing that your risk of diabetes goes up with BMI, so the whole thing is kind of moot. The whole thing is a very good example of choosing a biased sample set, and then people not looking carefully at what the study actually says. Regardless, I don't read my mail replies. What if, just hear me out, what if you could aim for being skinny and healthy? Kaith Devourer adds, I thought your weight had nothing at all to do with your health. For fudge's sake, they need to be consistent. This one comes to us from Love Dove Bunny. Hello, I'm new, and this is my first post. Smile, hearts. Nice to meet you. Content warning. Question about medication and refusing to be weighted. Does anyone know if you need to be weighed to be prescribed birth control or antidepressants? And if yes, then for what reason? The last doctor I went to for my period problems was very polite, but said I just need to lose weight. It didn't offer any options. I went to see another doctor sometime, preferably endocrinologist, gynecologist, or both, and I kind of want to be prepared. <laughs> I've also heard from Fenn's family that endocrinologists are obsessed with weighing you. Is that true? I really wouldn't appreciate it, unless 100,000% necessary to be prescribed medication. I'm not in the U.S. if that matters at all. Q without you replies, Why are endocrinologists so obsessed with collecting data to help them determine hormonal and glandular function? My neurologist is so obsessed with my brain and spine, it really weirds me out. Like, get a life loser. Makika adds, What a creep! Ew! Dangerous safety pin. That's nothing. I'm beginning to suspect that my podiatrist is obsessed with my feet. Bob the Orange Cat. 
They're like the Quentin Tarantino of doctors. Captain Dave adds, Listen, you guys aren't going to believe this, but my dentist put his fingers in my mouth. E-Doctor has the last word. Is that all? My urologist can't keep his hands off my... This one's from Lisa Daisy. It's another infographic. Thoughts you might have when your child eats three cookies. Rather than they're obsessed with sweets, you might try, I can trust my child to eat. Rather than will they ever stop? Instead, if they eat too many, that's important feedback for them. Rather than I need them to stop, try sugar is just a nutrient. Rather than they need to eat less sugar, try I hope they enjoy these yummy cookies. Inside Sympathy replies to that. My older sister once got into a jar of fudge for hot fudge sundaes when she was probably six or seven. You know, old enough that my mum could give me a bath without having to constantly watch and ate the whole thing in the space of about 35 minutes, the time it took to give me a bath. She ate herself sick and threw up chocolate fudge all over the living room. The moral of this story, you inherently cannot trust the judgment of a creature with poor impulse control. My dog would also eat a jar of fudge, or fudge vomit for that matter, and it would kill him. Children do not know enough about their bodies to be intuitive about that stuff. They need to learn and be taught. Panda Katie added, This isn't really related, but like a decade ago, we came downstairs to find my cousin, probably six, I don't remember exactly, she might have been even younger, asleep on the couch with an empty jar of frosting in her hands and frosting on her face. My parents gave her heck, you know. How could you eat that? Frosting! What were you thinking? She swore she didn't do it, but I mean, she was holding the jar and the frosting was on her face. For years, any time we thought she was lying, the frosting incident was brought up. That is, until about three Christmases ago. My sister made a confession. She ate the frosting. She smeared it on her sleeping cousin's face. She put the jar into her hands. For at least a decade, my sister framed this child, who was seven years younger than her. So, uh, if my sister, who was like 13, lacked the impulse control to not eat a jar of frosting and frame a child, younger children definitely don't. From Fording Baskoban. Trigger warning, mention of actual weight, pain issues, medical situations. I'd like to post a little yay next generation of HAES if I may. My daughter has had a chronic pain condition for the last four years. She is 17. We saw a new doctor yesterday, and one of the things my daughter said was, I will not blame my weight for my pain. I've heard it before. Oh, your BMI is too high? And it is not why I am in pain. Please don't even try that. I won't go there. And the doctor heard her. My daughter is 5'5 and weighs about 186. For reference, I'm 5'10 and weigh 170. She dances 20 hours a week, and she heard, well, your weight from so many doctors. She still pushes back, and I'm so proud of her. Autotelica replies, I'm not understanding where this kind of arrogance comes from. It's not like the doctors are telling her that her pain doesn't exist, or that it's a figment of her neurotic mind. The extra weight equals pain connection is not only empirically well supported, but it just makes common sense. If someone strapped an extra 25 pounds to your back and made you wear it all day, wouldn't you feel some aches and pains? Of course you would. In this case, it's closer to strapping an extra 60 pounds on your back. Fording Bascoban adds, They go visit so many doctors who all probably have the same opinion, then keep shopping around until one comes along and just confirms their biases, probably just to save themselves the headache. I mean, she's 17 and already saying, I've heard it before. Being that young and having had visited so many doctors for the same chief complaint, red flag. Also, assuming that's even how things transpired. Being aggressively assertive with your doctor isn't always the right course of action, especially if they didn't give you a reason to be in the first place. At your initial visit, try to let them do their job and be as objective as possible, then judge and react accordingly. From Panicking Armistice Supporting people with EDs through recovery before their disease literally kills them? Uh-uh. Blaming your obesity on the mentally ill? That's the one. Savitra Bai replied, I have binge eating disorder and recently had a relapse because of the reopening of restaurants and parties. The HAES movement enables EDs like mine, and I was part of those Tumblr communities at one point. BED is actually more common than anorexia and bulimia. 
This one comes from Tiger Shark Bite. Having a higher BMI actually means you're less likely to die from diseases than thin people. For example, a fat person has better chances of surviving a heart attack than a thin person. Hmm. Altruistic narcissist replies. In other words, obese people who have heart attacks more often are more likely to survive, but overall have a higher rate of heart attacks and death from heart attacks. It's like saying certain drug addictions aren't bad, because those addicts survive more overdoses. Lies, darn lies, and statistics. Substantial Spring added. Plus, don't obese people tend to have heart attacks earlier in life than non-obese? Or, well, whatever adds. Yes, there's actually a study out there that shows smokers are more likely to survive heart attacks than non-smokers for just this reason. That is, because they have heart attacks younger. From Lisa Daisy. Not only are we the only species that voluntarily starves itself, but we consider it a healthy behavior. Outlandish Nessie IC replies, Nah, most species will gorge, otherwise dogs and cats wouldn't get fat. Snapping turtles get pretty massive. Bears put weight on as much as they can. Humans are the only ones that have the cognition to see the long-term effects and adjust. From Patagonian Pour Over. It's an Instagram post from Nicole Cruz MSRDN. How much you move your body in one day does not determine how much you're allowed to eat. Eat the amount that feels good to you. Key in the Rock replies, How much money you make in a month does not determine how much you're allowed to spend. Just spend the amount that feels good to you. Patagonian pour over. Unsurprisingly, those who have issues with sicko also have issues with budgeting. Rainbow in the Sea brings us. I went to a Target Superstore today and was appalled by the minuscule plus-size section. Everything in this picture and nothing more was plus-sized. Now here's the pictures of the skinny people section, and I didn't even take pictures of the entire thing. It stretches all the way to the back of each photo. I'd say out of the entire adult clothes section, only one-eighth of that is plus-size. Not to mention that the entire plus-size section was made up of only one brand. When fat people tell you of their mistreatment, we're not exaggerating. Listen to us. End fat phobia. Womp womp rats replied. Mass market discount retailers put out what sells. Period. LFK Heel adds. That's the weirdest thing to me. Retailers, especially at that scale, keep mind-numbing amounts of track of what sells, how fast, and when. 40% of the U.S. is obese. If only one-eighth of the clothing section is plus-sized, it means it doesn't sell well enough. Apparently, 40% of the population only buys enough clothing from this retailer to justify 13% of the clothing floor space. Womp Womp Rants added, What they call the skinny people section still has clothes for people who are overweight. 2XL and sometimes even 3XL is just an off-the-rack size now. Target often knows more about what people buy than the actual people buying. They've gotten in trouble for sending people ads for prenatal vitamins when their family didn't realize that they were pregnant. Now they still know what you buy, but they're more secretive about it. From A Witch Betwixt. Diet industry value in the USA, $71 billion. Number of studies to show any diet works long term, zero. Indian Each Dutch replies, What's long term? This drives me nuts. I am also 10 years of keeping off 80 pounds. Am I a unicorn or something? Scatterbrain adds, a diet in their mind is something you do for a month or whatever limited time. Then you can do whatever you want and be a lower weight than when you started. By that logic, yeah, 0% of diets work long term. What all these studies show is that old habits die hard, and most people aren't willing to make even a year-long lifestyle change that results in consuming fewer calories or burning more calories. The ones that keep the lifestyle change also keep the weight off. And they link a study. Brought to us by Lisa Daisy. Good morning to everyone except that trainer who told me you can overeat healthy foods too and tried to tell me I could only have one teaspoon of carefully measured peanut butter and two tiny containers of carbs per day. JMP replies, Clearly, this person has never eaten an entire container of dried prunes and then regretted it in the middle of the night as they're sitting on the toilet while their partner is fast asleep in the other room because they exercise self-control with the prune-eating like a decent person. Brought to us by Elmir2000. It's another infographic. 
What you can tell about a person based off their body size. How much they eat? No. What they eat? No. How much they work out? No. How healthy they are? No. Their mental health? No. Stop making assumptions and giving unsolicited advice if it's not your place to. Yes. Adorable Albatross replied, But for some reason this doesn't hold for skinny people. According to them, we all suffer from an eating disorder and are about to die of starvation. From Barry X. Lime. Yet another infographic. A few gentle reminders. Your weight is the least interesting thing about you. Cleanses create expensive pee. Fat is not a feeling. Keto is a treatment for patients with epilepsy. You can eat at any time that you're hungry. Diets don't work. And why Lucy replied, Keto is a treatment for epilepsy and can help with other health issues, including managing weight. Who knew that a diet could have multiple uses? Brought to us by your a wild man. I went to Goodwill today and was absolutely appalled. None of their clothes were above an XL. They had racks upon racks of clothes, and I found two, two pieces that were plus-sized. And you want to know what they were labeled? Plus. They couldn't even write the darn size they were. So the only way to find out was through the humiliation of trying them on and seeing them not fit. There was no other way to figure out the size since the original tags weren't there. And all they were labeled was plus. I am disgusted by this blatant fat phobia of not giving a fudge at all about fat customers. I am disgusted that finding clothes as a fat person is so darn hard that none can be found at thrift stores. And don't even get me started on regular stores. I'm angry. Thanks for not giving a fudge about me, Goodwill. Smile. Big block of tofu replied. Okay, so we're not supposed to lose weight because that's fat phobic. But then thrift stores are fat phobic because they don't have enough plus size clothes because so few get donated. But in order for someone to donate their clothes, they have to lose weight, which is fat phobic. I don't think I've had enough coffee for this yet. I'm just hard on clothes in general, so I tend not to buy a lot of them. Which means I never have much I can donate. But I'm planning on donating some stuff now that I've lost enough weight that I really can't wear it anymore. I'm guessing that I didn't get fat enough for my old clothes to fit this person. Is that also fat phobic? I've lost track. From Tinny R. Someone writes, Hi, just here to recommend a fabulous book, Anti-Diet by Christy Harrison. She's a registered dietitian with a master in public health, so she understands how to read and interpret scientific studies. If you are interested in dismantling diet culture and the bogus statistically speaking myth that links obesity to a plethora of health problems, it's a great resource with many peer-reviewed references. Smile. Outdoor Toast replies, I tried reading this book last month. I try to read about a lot of things I actively disagree with sometimes to get a better understanding of what other people believe and why. I made it through the introduction and just could not keep going. I skimmed a few chapters before giving up. The writing reads like a high school persuasive essay, but with a lot of cattiness. She makes claims with dubious support, then uses them to support tenuously related other claims. Much of the reasoning and support seems to be circular, and single sentences would drag in multiple concepts that have nothing to do with each other, like they were supremely relevant. A lot of things were brought up as self-evident concepts, but they absolutely were not. She also had a distinct tendency to make sweeping generalizations about given populations experiences in the world, and I got the vibe that she thought her personal experience was absolutely typical. I don't think she actually believes that, but that was definitely how the book made me feel as I read through it, and it made me feel quite alienated as someone who did not have that type of experience. I'm obviously not the target audience, though, so I shouldn't complain about not being represented in narratives. It just wasn't a good book. I've struggled through a lot of bad books, but I just couldn't force my way into this one. From Helen Kieran. Often people stop shaking your scrunched over belly fat and calling it part of the body positivity movement. That's just about as offensive as a thin person putting out a fat suit and parading around in it to understand the way fat people live. Just stop. I said what I said. Peace. Malarsa replies. They seem so resistant to the idea that thin people have fat too. It's always, OMG, you're not allowed to show your skin folds. But first of all, nobody died and made you king. 
If then people want to do that, then all you can do is whine into the void and die incredibly mad about it. You can't stop them. Second, it's fat. We all have fat. You don't own the market on fat. You don't get to gatekeep fat. Every living person has fat. Stop trying to convince people that reality isn't real. There's such a weird disconnect with reality with these people. Well, if she's fat, then what does that make me? Fatter. And you keep insisting that it doesn't matter, or is a positive thing, so why do you keep denying it so hard? That thin person with belly rolls has fat. You're fatter. Just own it and stop trying to twist everyone else's perception. I guess it's just body positivity for me and not for thee. Heaven forbid thinner people want to be positive about their bodies or share their insecurities. If it makes a single fat person mad or sad or jealous anywhere, then nobody's allowed to do anything. How about no? I just wanted to add for people on the other end of the spectrum, you'll always have a little bit of fat. It's natural. It's a good thing. Please don't feel bad about it. This one's brought to us by Lisa Daisy. Tell me something you've learned about diet culture that shocked you. I'll start. That it's woven into our society and mindset at every turn and has racist roots. Once you see it in everything with brand names with skinny in them, to the sizes carried in stores, to the size of airplane seats and more. I'm learning more all the time. And this has been extremely personally challenging, mentally and emotionally. There are days I wonder if I can make it through the impending social stigma of weight gain, the body I'm in, especially when the body people have come to know me, to exist in, was the one that was only ever achieved via dieting and diet culture. Thaumaturge replies, The racism thing about dieting is so bizarre to me. Everyone has just swallowed this fact whole, and the fact is that everyone of every low income group has been going up in size for about 40 years. The ism is a class based one. It's about making poor people unable to make healthy choices and then mocking them for it. At the height of institutionalized racism, like legally enforced segregation, people of color were pretty thin, as was most of American society. Heck, in one of his early singles, Fat Domino sings, They call me the fat man because I weigh 200 pounds. The whole idea of what fat is has evolved significantly, including among communities of people of color. Like we have some pretty good evidence from photographs, songs like that, all kinds of media that everyone was thinner. The fattest man in the world that circuses used to employ would be considered small today. I hate this fat acceptance movement. If you keep people from changing their lifestyle, you are killing them. Stop telling them about a mythical past of fatness and no consequences for the decisions people make. Stop lying. Kamalovich adds, The incidence rate of obesity among different classes surprised me when I went to look it up based on your comment. This is for the U.S. and from the CDC. Among men, obesity prevalence was lower in the lowest and highest income groups compared with the middle income group. Researchers observed this pattern among non-Hispanic white and Hispanic men. Obesity prevalence was higher in the highest income group than in the lowest income group among the non-Hispanic black men. Among women, obesity prevalence was lower in the highest income group than in the middle and the lowest income groups. Researchers observed this pattern among non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic Asian, and Hispanic women. Among non-Hispanic black women, there was no difference in obesity prevalence by income. I thought this was super interesting that among non-black men, obesity was actually higher for the middle class than the lower class, as I had expected it to be higher for a lower income. So, long story short, it's not necessarily true that the poorest classes are the fattest classes. This one comes to us from Aram. This was originally published in some magazine called The Insider. Research links fat shaming with poor health. In one study, overweight women who were affected by fat shaming were found to be more at risk of heart disease and diabetes than average weight women who had a positive image of their bodies. Blue in the Sky replies, I read the actual scientific article they linked, and holy heck did they misrepresent it. So wrong that I think they may have linked the wrong article. In the actual study, all participants were obese. Also, the article wasn't studying weight bias generally. It was studying internalized weight bias. That isn't an objective measure of the stigmatization someone actually faces. It's a measure of what they perceive to be victimization. The article concluded that only high cholesterol was significantly associated with internal bias. There was no significant relationship among heart disease, diabetes, BMI, or any other factor. And another interesting tidbit, despite fat activists constantly saying that BMI and anti-fatness are racist, 
white women had the highest scores on perceived and internalized stigma. From Skate O'Clock, a little bit of sanity. A dietitian writes, I keep seeing TikTok saying, what I eat in a day is a fat person who doesn't care and isn't trying to lose weight. Typically ranting that the diet industry is predatory, and to be fair, I'd agree with that. Videos gorging on cookies and chips and fries. Do they not realize how predatory the processed food industry is? Selling you lies that their food is good for families makes life easier and is fun. Just look at the marketing. Family's enjoying frozen pizza and mom is happy that it's so easy for her. Look at packing labels. The big box of Frosted Flakes says family-sized. And the big bag of M&M's says sharing size, implying that their food brings people together. So, congratulations, by trying to avoid being preyed on by the supplement industry, you instead fell victim to the food industry, which doesn't care that its foods will kill you. Haley Rose replies, I never thought of all those family-sized bags of chips and stuff, but they are totally right that you only see that on those unhealthy snack food packages. And now, Dechonkers. This comes to us from I Love Cheesy Poofs. There's three pictures of a black dog with a white stripe on his belly. In the first picture, he's laying on the ground, looking kind of fat, and he looks kind of miserable. In the second two pictures, he looks much thinner, his hair looks better, and he looks more active. Mr. Pugsley has been dechonked. JFM brings us a rather nice picture of their orange cat. How many calories a day for a 14-pound mini chonk to lose 3 pounds safely? From Cowgirl Sheep. This is a famous kind of cat, but I can't remember what it's called. It's kind of got a light brown coat, a black tail, black ears, kind of a black mask on its face, and its fur kind of fades from a light brown to a dark brown near the tail. Is he getting chonky? 13 pound boy. Sequin Weekend brings us a picture of their cat, who, to me, looks like he could play Garfield in a live action movie. Rusty is down another 0.3 kilograms this month, so he's now 10 kilograms exactly. Steady progress is the way to go. From Zenadez, it's a white cat with green eyes. He's got spots all over his back and kind of a gray head. Peanut, nearly two years since adoption. She has a deceptive sweater leftover. I'm not sure what that means, except maybe the cat still looks a little puffy. From J Bunny, it's a picture of a black cat with kind of speckled with gray, and he's got a brown nose, which is kind of strange looking. Day one of her diet, she's going from 18 pounds to 13.5 pounds. Here's to good health, excited to see her results. Maven of Funk Mutation brings us a picture of their black cat. He's got green eyes, and as he looks at the camera, he looks very disappointed. Boba, though recovering from her binge that resulted in a 1K vet bill, is still mad that I'm portion feeding her, and is appalled at how late lunch is today. How dare I? The Greatest Jaggy brings us a picture of their gray cat with a white belly. He's got kind of a bushy tail, looks like he might be part squirrel. Is my cat a chonker? She's 10.5 pounds. From Unicorn Dance Party. It's a picture of a gray cat. For once, it appears to be all one solid color. Kind of strange. In the first picture, the owner's holding the cat up. And let me tell you, this cat's pretty big. It stretches from about the owner's shoulder down to the owner's knees. I mean, he must be one tall cat. In the second picture, he's just laying on the ground. Moose Dechonkification. JFM brings us a picture of their orange cat. He's hanging around with a pink octopus. It's kind of a cute picture. 14 pound kitty chonk hasn't lost any weight three weeks on diet. Vet said she should be losing one pound a month. What's going on? From Electronic Bear. It's a gray stripy cat with a white belly. This baby went from 17.2 pounds to 17 pounds in a week. She has no idea why I'm so proud of her. And so another video comes to an end. Special thanks to Hannah McNally, Carl Williams, and Daniel Korov for their support. I hope everybody enjoyed the video, and I'll talk at you guys again in a little while.